Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by Ike Eastman and Scott Reekers of Eastman's Publishing, Inc. The Eastman's have been known for Western hunting for decades and know their stuff. Ike and Scott broke down their approach to how to apply for tags in the West, looking at the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies to have tags in your pocket every single year. The Spartan Forge app utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, including GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic, and state research. The new app includes GPS mapping with incredible aerial imagery, offline dependability, deer prediction, weather updates, journal entries, and much more. You can use the code East Meets West to save 20% off the Spartan Forge app at SpartanForge.ai. Tethered is a company founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting. They have mobile hunting gear options for all types of hunters and continue to push the envelope. Check out the new Skeletor climbing sticks that weigh in at only two pounds and are pretty light on your wallet compared to some other lightweight climbing sticks out there. To learn more about tethered and saddle hunting, head over to tetherednation.com. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. The products are back with a lifetime no-fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. You can now save some money on bundling options of spotting scopes, rifle scopes, and more on the website. Whether you're looking for an ultralight setup or an optics powerhouse, Maven has you covered. You can use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST-GIFT for a full free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. Now, I have a new partner here that has uh, jumped on the the show here, and this is Kip Folks, who is a co-founder of Under Armour, an avid hunter, and just an all-around hardworking American. When I heard that he was building a brewery, I was pretty excited to, to check that out. Since then, I've become friends with Kip. He's been on the podcast, and Big Truck Farms has grown into what I would expect. He has been extremely supportive of this podcast and hunting in general, so it went without saying that Big Truck would make a great partner of the podcast. The Big Truck name and icon promotes the idea of adventure and going past the unknown. They embrace the mindset of hard work in the outdoor lifestyle on the farm with an earn a beer mentality. They support and host archery shoots, donate to veterans, and make damn good beer. Check out Big Truck Farms at btfbeer.com, and if you're in the area, visit the farmhouse in Parkton, Maryland. I'm going to be heading down there later this month to check it out and hang out at the pretty incredible venue that they have there, brewery and, and events and everything else. So check that out and support Big Truck Farms. All right, so this week's Mountain Buck Monday... Uh, uh, post over on social media you can find that at east meets west hunt on instagram and east meets west outdoors on facebook and for the podcast just the mountain buck story of the week and this one comes from timmy sutton out of pennsylvania since i've been six years old my dad has had me shooting bow growing up i love the thrill of archery hunting and even competing in the ibo up until 2017 i've killed just about every buck with my bow In 2016, I started hunting mountain game lands and fell in love with it. The learning, the preparation, and the chase of not knowing what is all out there. On October 28, 2017, on a rainy day, I had the best day in the woods of my life, seeing more deer than I have in one day and countless shooter bucks. I did not get a shot, but on that day, I fell in love with the mountain. I did not kill my buck in archery in 2017, but still consider it the best season I've had from how much I learned and the fun that I had. The first day of the season, I sat for a little while 
but the area I was hunting was pressured pretty well with groups of drivers, so I left. I didn't hunt again till Thursday morning and was welcomed to the woods by someone hanging a stand about 60 yards from mine. I left to go home and waited out to late season archery, but my best friend told me to slow walk since I was already out and see what happens. He texted me around 7.05, and by 7.34, this buck was down. My first PA public land mountain buck. I didn't get it in archery season, but hard work always pays off. And I love these stories that come in from people at their first, you know, mountain buck experience and just that you can just tell in the writing how passionate they are about it and that this won't be the the first one for Timmy there. So I appreciate you sending in that story and you want to see the photo, head over to social media and check that out. Uh, send in your, your stories to Bo at eastmeetswesthunt.com. I'd love to get those featured on here and share those stories. I do have uh, another new hat that's being released here. Should be live on the website by the time this, this podcast goes out. Um, it's the new Predator hat, which is an OD green. It's a performance hat. So if you've been familiar with us, uh, there was another hat that I have on the website there. Where I had a couple of them um, with the, the flag patch hat that was in like kind of a, a khaki color. Um, I still have that in stock, but this one I changed it up a little bit and I went back to Legacy and had them make this performance hat that is it is has a stretch material to it. It wicks sweat really well and I'm I'm happy with how it how it turned out. I got the flag patch on it again, which is in a in a black lettering and tan background. It's a really cool hat, I think, for high performance type stuff as far as training goes, western hunts, anything like that, shed hunting. I think it'll be a really, really good hat for people to check out. So if you want to support the podcast and take a look at it, head over to eastmeetswesthunt.com slash shop and check that out. All right, so on today's episode, as I said, I have Ike Eastman and Scott Reekers. And I think this this episode will be particularly helpful for those of you that are just getting into Western hunting or even those that have been in it for a little bit. But as things are changing and tags are getting harder to get, really, I mean, Ike will say it best in here, knowledge is king and being able to to know that information. You know, and I, I referenced my big inspiration, one of my big inspirations was Cameron Haynes and still is. Um, as he got me into it from his book, Backcountry Bow Hunting. And I think that book was incredible and uh, really got me going to get out there and, and you know chase elk in the mountains. And what you'll hear me reference that in there and laugh about it was just because I, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be, but it was it was definitely worth it. But for those of you that you know aren't looking at it from a uh, a long-term strategy and just want to get your toes wet and see how it is, you know, maybe elk isn't the, aren't, isn't the right animal for you to chase right off the bat. You know, it's up to you and in, in your personal goals and whether you're okay with uh, delayed gratification on that standpoint, or if you want to um, try out antelope or deer or something else first, I mean, there's no shame in any of that. It's up to you and what you want to do. So, Anyways, I hope that you enjoy this episode and get some useful information out of it. If you like it, give the podcast a review, share it with your friends, and I I greatly appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of your week. All right, we're live. Ike Eastman, welcome back to the show, and now we have a new guest on here. We also have Scott Reeker, so thanks for coming on, guys. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. I, I don't want people to think we kicked Guy off the podcast tour. He, yeah. He's just <laughs> he's still on vacation for for the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you you replaced him with a, a younger version here with uh, Scott. <laughs> hey, and, uh, and slightly taller. Yeah. <laughs> well, and let's be clear here. Just so you know, Guy doesn't like punch me later. I am no Guy Eastman. Like, there, he is one of a kind. The sniper himself. So. <laughs> yeah well again guys thanks for thanks for coming on here and and talking to me it's an exciting time of year as we're uh getting ready for well kind of starting application season and stuff so i figured it'd be a great time for 
for you guys to come come on and chat with me a little bit. And it was funny we were talking right before um, right before we started recording here, and it started getting funny. So I was like, we better uh, better <laughs> better turn on the recording. Uh, Scott had said he's like, did you get a care package from us yet? And I was like, what are you what are you talking about? And uh, take it take it from there, Scott. <laughs> So one of the things that we've, that's been near and dear to the Eastman's heart for many, 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 many moons is the migration routes across Wyoming of mule deer. In fact, the really, when I think of Eastman's and I'm 38 years old and I was raised on a lot of Mike Eastman's videos, we would fight each other to watch the latest one, especially when they had a few bucks on them. And those bucks names were Popeye, Morty, and Goliath. And those three were living legends at the time is what Mike Eastman coined them as. And in, in, in that vein, we were able to work with a local company called Wyoming Whiskey. Well, and I'll, let me, yeah, let me, let add, me, let me interrupt yeah, just a minute. You, you <laughs> yeah. Being that you were raised with them, you just glanced over who they were. So yes. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into who these deer were. So these deer were uh, unbelievable specimens of trophy mule deer bucks um you know 242 inch uh, mainframe type deer just unbelievable and the the unique thing is that they have multiple years these, these deer would migrate 200 miles over two mountain ranges and a couple major rivers to mm. to winter on what's called the de- the red desert here in wyoming and so these deer would show up every year for i think my dad has footage of pape for four or five different years yeah. different winters and no one could figure out where those bucks summered. They knew it was in the mountains, but they didn't know where until one guy, him and his son, uh, it, it, the gentleman actually, uh, he lives, I think, on the East Coast now. But he he drew the tag and came. him and his son came out on a fishing trip. And they hiked into this mountain range and were fishing this lake. And he decided to hike over the top of this ridge to see what was on the other side basically doing a scouting mission. I'm sure you've, you've done that before, right? Take the summer trip and two or three day camping trip into the your area. And he finds this deer takes, gets so close. He can take a photo with a 35 millimeter camera. I mean, 80 yards, 70 yards, mm-hmm. maybe from this deer standing in an open rocks, rock face. Oh, Reekers has got the book. It's the cover of one of my dad's books. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. So too bad. you know Popeye. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. do now. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Holy cow! All right. So, so that deer is called Popeye. Well, with the migration initiative that's going on in Wyoming, we helped them raise awareness with a video that we did, and we took some of that old footage from the '80s and '90s, and we interlaced it with some new stuff. And uh, Guy and I. Uh, we actually flew, I'm a pilot. So we flew in a little uh, bush plane. We flew his route because the guy now he told us exactly pinned it on a map, exactly what Lake he was at and where Popeye was. So we flew from there to over the mountain ranges and all the stuff to where Popeye, where my dad would film him in the winter, just kind of showing how far these deer migrate every year. And they're doing a big, an initiative here in Wyoming and, and it just started uh, all the other states. In fact, Utah just started theirs. Uh, I'm going to the hunt expo in a couple of weeks to, well, a month and a half to do a lecture on um, the migration initiative. And it's called, they're doing a, it's a whole day event called the uh, deer summit. And basically they're trying to work, uh, raise awareness and they got the government to give them a bunch of money to help these corridors because there's pinch points on these migration routes. If via highways or, you know, urban sprawl or oil field or whatever. And the, the, the government gave them some money in order to keep these pinch ways, pinch points open. If it's, you know, fences, you know, making them uh, wildlife friendly fences or, crossings over big major highways or you know they bought they actually bought like 300 acres that was supposed to be a development that they found through gps technology and collaring these deer they found that all five thousand of these deer go through this one pinch point so they bought the property gave it to the state to manage so it so it'll always be there and always be open for these deer this is a really long story to tell you. You're getting a bottle of whiskey from Wyoming whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> that we we worked with Wyoming whiskey and the Mule Deer Foundation, and we went and bought a barrel of whiskey, and we went and tested 
probably more than I should tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Barrels of whiskey. I, I was milk. not on that trip, but I have heard stories. <laughs> it was fun. It was it, look it up on YouTube. We have a video of it, but I will. Um, <laughs> it, it was fun. And and we picked a bottle or a barrel, and then we we put the barrel in bottles, and we put our own labels on them, and uh, we kept uh, we gave we kept a few for us and some of our friends like yourself, and then the rest of them we donated to the Mule Deer Foundation, and they are auctioning them off at their banquets, and uh, they've got up to like twelve hundred dollars per bottle of this stuff. So really? it's yep. it's really good whiskey. Uh, it's really potent. I will tell you that. Yeah. And uh, and. And, you know, it's, and it's because it has, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm a big whiskey. I'm, guy, not, so. I'm, I'm not alone. This is, this yeah. is what it looks like. I put one of them in a cage so I don't drink oh. it in my office. <laughs> do, you, do you have it locked with you don't oh, have yeah. a key to it? <laughs> no, no. You take the lid off. This, this is complete. For those at home, this thing is literally in a cage. Yeah. That in a order to get to cage. it, you have to take it's like something you put a, hundred, a monkey in. There's the there's like there's 72 <laughs> washer nuts on that thing in order to get it off. So <laughs> you're not going to just Jones for it and then pick it off. Anyway, um, but yeah, so you're getting one of these bottles. Hopefully, it shows awesome. up and doesn't isn't broke. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's awesome. I I will uh, I'll be waiting for that to show up. Hopefully, it comes in tomorrow <laughs> for for New Year's. You for know, New, yeah, yeah. yeah, share it with your friends. Yeah. So. so Appreciate you coming or letting us come on again. Yeah, uh, it's good to be back. We must have done an okay job to for your for you and your audience that you wanted us back. Yeah, you did. It was uh, it, it was that was a great episode that we had did there before and went on the full background of you and your family and the business and everything. And I thought that was really cool and and talked about trophy hunting and and all of the ins and outs of that. Um, but while in case anyone didn't listen to that one, like, do you want to give a, a quick background on yourself? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm a third generation uh, in the Western hunting industry. Uh, my grandfather started in 1957 film and wildlife in Alaska, and he would bring those, those films back, which they didn't have audio. And uh, he would, he would sh- live narrate them in front of an audience of, you know, they, they'd fill the high school auditorium with people and he would live narrate it. And then, you know, he'd have, he killed a big, huge polar bear. And towards the end of those lectures, he would actually take the polar bear on tour with him. And uh, he'd be standing next to an 11 foot bear that's on a stand that stands like 12, five, I think 12, six. Um, Actually that bears in in my brother's house. It, (laughs) it's, it's daunting. (laughs) You're not gonna have to worry about, you're not gonna have to worry about uh, breaking and entering when they walk in, there's a 12 foot bear standing there. Yeah. There, but, there may have been serious discussions in that home life about that bear. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not, yeah, it doesn't go well with the with the uh, flowered couch. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, yeah, so that's what my grandfather did. And then my dad, and then later in life, uh, he started making theatricals and actually in movie theaters and it was all Western wildlife stuff. He had some wolves at some, at a time. And then in the eighties, uh, while my grandfather was doing this, my dad was in Vietnam and then he got out of Vietnam. And the only thing he knew how to do is hunt. In fact, he always tells us, he says, I didn't realize when I was growing up that not everybody slept in a sleeping bag every night, all summer <laughs> bouncing around the, you know, the mountains in the U S and Canada and Alaska. He goes, I thought everybody did that. He goes, I went to Vietnam and found out that there's a lot of guys that didn't even know what a sleeping bag was. And I had to show them how to zip it up. <laughs> so so he he got out of the military and said, the only thing I know how to do is hunt. And the only way to make a living hunting now is uh, outfitting. So he was an outfitter for a number of years. And then my grandfather kind of went off out of the theatricals and went into some other other things um, and the housing market. And we grew up, I grew up in Jackson back when Jackson was the poorest County in the U S and um, it was, it was a really rough place to live. There was nothing to do there in the winter to make a living and, and hunt was about it. And so in the eighties, when it started to boom, Jackson started to boom. My dad was a contractor. And then, and then my, one of my uncles uh, told my grandfather, we should take all those old theatricals and all that stuff and put them on VHS tape and sell them to, video stores like Blockbuster. And well, I know there's only one of those left, but it, it was like, it was, it was our, my kid, my age as a kid, that's what our red box was yeah. or Netflix. You had to actually go rent a videotape and put it into a, a recorder and play it. 
that's what Scott grew up on is the <laughs> videos of my grandfather's. Yep. And then my dad started making them in the eighties and started the magazine, the, the Eastman's hunting journal in 87 and the bow journal in 99 and the TV show about the same time, about 99. And, uh, you know, we've had, I think we're on our 29th season or 27th season of, of the, on the outdoor channel and both magazines are still going strong. We have uh, a bunch of other stuff. And now in the last two years, we started a digital version of all this and took the research that's been in the back of the magazine. We're the first one to do area research and publish it, you know, as far as expert analysis and draws and all that stuff, we've been doing it for over 25 years. Um, there's other companies that started it, you know, a couple years ago, but we've been doing it for a long time, have all that history yeah. and all that knowledge. And we just recently in the last couple of years turned it into a digital sortable, you know, all of all that type of stuff. We call that Eastman's tag hub. Um, we don't, we always say, don't just hunt, don't just, uh, don't just hunt it, but tag it. And, you know, that's all about, hunting is one thing, but actually having success yep. is what we're after. And our, that's our, our mission statement is to help hunters become better hunters and uh, all while being entertained because nobody wants to sit through lectures that are boring. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. That was, whew, I need a drink now. <laughs> <laughs> you better start taking all those nuts off. It's going to take you a little bit. So hopefully, <laughs> well, hopefully Scott, get, Scott has don't, a, don't worry, a I long, ha I have a, <laughs> <laughs> you got another one that's almost gone. <laughs> Man. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's let's transition over to you, Scott. What's uh what's your background here? The first time on the, the podcast. Okay. So I have been working for Ike now for eight years, um, February second. I am I've had several titles over the course of time, but digital media has been my big umbrella. Um, social media was basically what I was hired for. And then I said, Hey, I think you're going to get to do a little bit more stuff. And so over time I've gotten to do a lot of different things. And Eastman's tag hub was my biggest project. Most recently we've, um, he actually talked with me about the idea and the concept in 2014 that he wanted it, but we had to find the right developers, the right product that we liked. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were giving the consumer um, exactly the experience that we wanted and wanted to make sure that the information was valuable. And so we worked really hard on that. Um, I am a certified mule deer nut. And so a lot of this. <laughs> that just <laughs> means he's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I am crazy. I, I love hunting high country mule deer, although I have to say, as I'm getting a little older, I think I might be OK with a few more camper hunts um, if I can you know, draw a few tags in the desert. Yeah. Um, we've been telling Scott for eight years when he started, he was just barely 30 here. And we've been telling Scott for a long time when you hit 38, man. Yeah, I'm telling you, your body <laughs> slows down. You start hurting in places. You, you know, things aren't the same. And I can remember a backpack hunt on a mule deer hunt with Scott, and he walked my butt into the ground. <laughs> and I was telling him all about this as I'm dying. You know, the next morning you wake up, you can't get out of your sleeping bag. And uh, I remember him going, I don't know. I, you know, you and Brandon have both been saying this for a number of years. I don't, I don't know if I believe that. Everybody's different type story. And all of a sudden, Scott turns 38 this year, comes back and says, <laughs> you know, those truck hunts, that that seems like a pretty good deal uh -huh, every <laughs> once in a while. Yep. <laughs> hey, I am not abandoning the llamas. I may just find more ways to ride horses. I might actually have to take a horse, you know, a few horse tips and tricks and that sort of thing. But I'm That's okay, okay with that. Tag Hub's going to have that, that too. It's going to have a... With livestock. Oh, did I just open up? Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Leaking it out a little bit. Oh, Reekers just crashed. Oh, I froze back. up again. I'm back. All right, yeah. I'm back now. <laughs> yeah, you guys had froze froze up for a second there, but um, yeah. So you're you're bringing in the livestock version, you know, into Tag Hub and being able. Well, I, I, I broke you broke up a little bit there, so yeah. Oh, so it's good because maybe I wasn't supposed to share that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was Scott doing that. He was. Uh... Yeah. He's like, you hey. don't know. There's a two second delay. He unplugged me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he, it's it's just about no. information and knowledge, nope. and yeah. and you know, li hunting with livestock is something a lot of guys are starting to get into and and uh, starting to utilize and realize that you know it makes it makes that 
that process a lot more enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you can take a little bit more weight. And, heck, our, Scott and I's last mule, <laughs> mule deer hunt, we had llamas. And yep. I took fold-up chairs to sit in and glass all day. Yep. And they're kind of nice. Yeah, that would be <laughs> yes. that would be awesome. I, I I'll be honest, I'm kind of scared of horses from the standpoint of riding them in just because I don't have much experience with it. And I'd done yeah. one hunt where some buddies had horses that they just we used it in pack gear in and uh I I just kinda let them do their thing, you know. I I helped with it a little bit, but I just wasn't <laughs> wasn't really sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> well that's yep. funny. Well horses are I I always say, you know, I grew up with them and uh, I've spent a lot of time on horseback and it's not w- if you're gonna get it hurt, it's when. Yep. You know, a horse they're a big animal and they're a big animal with a really small brain and they have the flight they don't have a fight uh personality they have a flight personality and they can make that happen really fast hmm. um llamas on the other hand they're one of my favorites especially in the back country yep. where you're going high country where the water's a problem um because they are bulletproof pretty much and <laughs> you know if you're hunting hunting in bear country like we do they have a, a really awesome uh <laughs> alarming call when a bear yes. comes around I just it watched a video of some, w- with llamas doing that with yeah. a bear here recently, and I was like, "Man, that is crazy!" The sound yep. that they were making. Yep. The, my was... my 2020 hunt had it. Like we, Brandon Mason actually went to go get water for camp, brought one llama down to help him haul the water back, and because he did that, um, this bear was coming upstream, and I think the bear wanted to eat the llama. And the llama freaked out, like blew up, like wanted to pull the tree over. Brandon didn't have his gun. I can't remember whether he had bear spray. I don't he think he did. He, he did yeah, have he his bear spray. spray. Okay. So and a he pistol, didn't. But. Okay. So he, um, he's there and he's about ready to take this thing out when it finally gets wind of Brandon because he's kneeling down pumping water and he stands up and this bear is huge. It's a slug. I saw it the next day on another ridge. And is probably one of the biggest bears I've ever seen. And I've seen quite a few at this point. And man, that thing was like wanting to munch that llama. Brandon stands up, <laughs> turns, tries to act big while the llama's freaking out, wanting to pull this this uh, tree over. And the bear just kind of turns around and walks away like, oh, no, I don't feel like messing with you. But yeah, it, true, it was ready to go. Are you, are you so. talking about grizz or black bear? No, this is a black bear. Okay. It was a slug. Like it was one of the bigger black bears that I've seen in Western Wyoming. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, so you're, um, uh, so you're kind of shying away from the high country going forward a little bit or not. Or is that, was that- Oh, you're, you're going to hurt his ego. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shying away. I'm finding new ways in. Okay. So okay. Right. I, I'm going to get, I've got a horse hunt that I really want to do. I've been bugging Ike to do it with me. We can't make the schedules work quite, but I've got a, I've got a plan for a horse hunt where we're going to ride about six miles in. And then it is some really remote country, but it's really good mule deer country, but it'll be a little bit later. We're going to avoid the crowds and do it that way. Um, and, and in doing that, one of the things I'm hoping that we do have is some snow so we can get a little bit different look and feel on the hunt. I don't want to die in the snow. Like, cause I, I'm just, I'm not a big fan of those, you know, crazy low temperature hunts. I'll, I do them, you know, I, and I like it for elk more cause we can, can stay warmer, build fires and glass, that sort of thing. But I, I really want to do that a little bit different feel of a high country hunt. Yeah. Oh, that'll, that, that sounds like it'll be pretty cool. Yeah. Yep. How was your fall? We haven't, we haven't talked since, since fall. How, how did you end up? Um, so I went to Colorado to hunt in the high country for mule deer. It's the first mule deer hunt that I was going on. And I ended up in the hospital with altitude sickness. Oh, so no. Yeah. Dang it. I, um, so I ended up finding out later that, cause I've been in the high country before and never had any issues with altitude. And I went there days early and it was fine. And, but when I went, when I went there, I was sick going into it and I thought I had COVID. So I went and got tested, came back negative, got tested again, came back negative, And I was just like feeling terrible. And I was like, ah, I'll be okay. Once I get going and I was hiking in and just having issues and issues. So I came back down and it was like 
three days before the season we were packing in and I came back down and stayed at lower elevations again and tried going back in and I got into I only made it about I don't know three and a half miles in maybe four miles in we were, my buddies were already in they were in about six or seven miles into our spot and I just set up camp and I had the camera guy with me and I was like I just I don't feel well. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to get my stove lit and I was having trouble. So I'm like, I'm going to lay down in the tent for a little bit. And I have this Garmin watch that was, uh, <clears throat> reads my blood oxygen level and it dipped down into the seventies and Whoa. yeah. And I was like, okay, this isn't good. I knew at that point, cause I've had a buddy of mine that got really sick from it before. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I need to go down and uh i left all my stuff there and hiked out and went into the hospital and they had me locked in there for most of the night and thought i had covid again i was like no i got tested but they had to do another test and and i ended up finding out that i had a sinus infection on top of some other things that led Ooh. into making that worse uh, when i went up to the high country so i was supposed to be there for 14 days I never got to go back into the high country again, but I did have an elk tag. So I found some lower elevation and got like two and a half days elk hunting. And at the end of it and came really close to, to killing a big bull. Um, and, uh, actually my release wouldn't clip on. I had some sticks uh, or stick or brush or something got shoved (laughs) down in there. So I had to get into my pack and get my other, my backup release. And even if I, if it would have clipped on, I don't know if I would have had the chance. He was about 60 yards away and pushing his cows up the hill. So I, I don't really think that I would have had a chance, but, um, yeah, it was kind of a, it was kind of a bummer compared to the last few years. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a tough, tough year. Um, yeah, that altitude sickness is rough. We had a, my brother did a hunt in Tajikistan for Marco Polo and our camera guy, Dan, he's actually our bow guy too. Um, he got really, really, really sick altitude sickness in the middle of nowhere and was coughing up yellow foam and, and it wasn't good at all. Um, they say that the healthier you are, the more susceptible you are to it because your heart's not used to working that hard to pump oxygen around. Mm-hmm. It, it, which makes sense. Guy, guy was in this camp with like six other guys and not a single one of them was as close to as healthy as either one Dan or guy. And none of those guys had problems. Dan almost killed him. I mean, he, they, they bring him back to 12, five and, and let him sit there and gave him obviously, oddly enough, they gave him Cialis and it opens (laughs) up your, yeah, opens up your, uh, capillaries and it, does other things. I, I was teasing him. There wasn't a goat in the country that was safe, but um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, a buddy of mine did that hunt in Kajikistan and he told, and I was actually texting him from land after I got out of the hospital, I was in a hotel and that's what he told me. He said, go out and buy Viagra or something. Yep. I said, I'm yep. not staying here in this, in this hotel room, <laughs> with the camera guy, me popping these pills, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't Why feel right. Turning the lights off. Don't worry about. Yeah. <laughs> TMI. Yeah. <laughs> but it works. It works like gangbusters. In fact, <laughs> um, he came back and he swears he swears every year he's going to take it on, in the backcountry with him. I don't know if he does or not. I've never I've never been able to hunt with Dan in the fall, but that that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Because <laughs> once you've had it, it it, it you you're more, way more susceptible to it because your heart, that's just how it works. But you know, and it, it bummed me out so much because I was looking forward to this hunt. I've wanted to do a mule deer hunt for so long and I just finally got the opportunity to it and cash in some points in Colorado. And I'd talked to you, Scott, about it when yep. I was using tag hub and going through and found a unit that I wanted to go into. And, uh, I mean, we were up there pretty high. I mean, I was above 12,000 feet where, wow. um, where I got yep. sick at and actually where we were camping at was, was just under 13,000. Wow. Um, so it was, it was up there quite a ways. And, well, uh, how did your buddies do They So my cousin Mason killed a, a nice four by four, the first opening day with his bow. Nice. And, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm literally packing out to go to the hospital and I get an in reach message that says oh. that I got a buck down and I'm like, this is terrible. So the next morning I came up and picked them up at the trailhead when, uh, they're just beat down and, you know, tired and it, mm-hmm. it, uh, monsoon weather that came in there oh, at the beginning yeah. of the season. And, uh, uh, they were their boots were soaked everything was was soaked and uh yeah so that was that was good that he was able to get one but um 
it was that kind of put more salt in the wound a little bit from not getting a getting to even be able to have a chance at it (laughs) so so the so the tag so the tag hub research worked it did yeah it was yeah it was it was a good definitely a a good unit and um there was there was plenty plenty of deer there so it was awesome it was great that that the high country is just so beautiful and i i love love going there so it's well i don't know about it anymore but no, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be fine. You just need to hunt Wyoming where it's only 10, five is the top end. Yeah, that's ex- exactly. <laughs> Our right. highest peaks 13, but we don't have very many of those. No. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds a lot better. <laughs> how, <laughs> how did you guys do this year? Uh, actually I had a really good fall. Um, I killed a, a real nice deer here in Wyoming. Uh, not my biggest, but it was, you know, one nineties <laughs> and, uh, I won't yeah, chase the antelope a lot and didn't do, didn't do great with that. My area that I've been putting in and hunting for since I was a kid, um, it's on the, it's on a downswing as far as trophy quality, lots of antelope, but just nothing huge. Um, I did not get in the elk woods for myself. I took, so that we started the tag hub and we started giving away hunts. And so we give away, I think there were yep. six hunts this fall Yep, and, every one of those hunts I get to go on, which is awesome because I get to go on a hunt and I don't have to worry about the trigger pull, but I still get to go and, yep. and hunt some really cool places. But you know, there's six guys and, uh, I hunted two antelope, uh, a deer an elk, no two deer and an elk or two elk. And, um, what else? Oh, there was a, a two more deer that in Montana that I, I wasn't on guy was on those two hunts, mm-hmm. but it was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. We killed one of the, one of the guys killed a 380 bull and uh, one of the guys killed a 208 mule deer, Jeez. um, 280 plus inch antelope. Uh, there's a guy that in Montana that killed a 152 whitetail. Um, it was, yep. it was a really, we had a really good fall company wide, probably one of the best falls yep. we've had. Uh, my brother killed a giant deer in Colorado and, um, yeah, it was, it was good. Killed a couple nice elk here in Wyoming, uh, dropped a guy off. I dropped Dan off in the back country, um, and on horseback. And <laughs> it's kind of the same thing as I, I drop him off 10 miles back. I basically said, okay, here's the deal. We're going to go as far as half, half the daylight and at half daylight, which is two o'clock that, that time of year. I'm tr- I'm dumping you off and turning around and coming home because I'm yeah. I'm not riding out in this bear infested son of a gun and in the dark and there's the trail we're on is it's horrific horrific uh, and so I dumped him off and but by, by the time I before I could get back to the truck I got an inreach hey kill the bull can you come in tomorrow no <laughs> you guys are gonna have to hang out for a day <laughs> I, got, I got two horses that lost shoes on the way out and. They just did 22 miles and we're going to have to give them a day off. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was, it was, they had a really good time back there chasing bears off their meat and it was crazy. Really? Oh, that's awesome. Scott had a good year. Yeah, I did. I killed a, killed a 185 inch mule deer. Um, actually, the, Ike knows this about me. I'm not a put a tape to him. I can look at a buck and I can tell you, usually within about five inches of what its range is. Um, and so, because I just rack bracket it, but as far as like actually putting the tape. Don't you to tell it, your wife within five inches? Oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He went there. Um, so, I'm sorry. I should have started drinking an hour ago, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so we uh i killed the that buck but i had a rough september man like I, you you were talking about being sick um i got i went scouting we brandon and i found some really nice bucks and about a week later i have the sore spot on my knee and i'm like what in the world and so it just starts getting sore and it, but it's on the skin it's not like inside i've had knee surgery so i know what structural feels like this was not structural it wasn't like bone pain or anything like that and I notice it starts getting red and i'm like okay i'm going to see the doctor and this is uh labor day weekend so i go in that sunday to see the doctor and we've got a really cool like call in like concierge type service here and so i see the one doctor and he's like yep that looks like cellulitis to me and i'm like what in the world is cellulitis i've never even heard of this too many twinkies sounds like to me <laughs> well proof's in the pudding um <laughs> but <laughs> so we uh cellulitis is like a skin infection 
you can get it anytime. It is literally when the bacteria that lives on you, gross, I know, but the bacteria that lives on you all the time normally, like decides to go crazy inside of a cut instead of just being the good bacteria that does what it's supposed to do, it actually like turns into something. And it's usually like staph or MRSA. They can't tell you without you getting tested. Well, we get that taken care of. Like, and, and, and the fun part about it is when you start treating it, it actually gets worse before it gets better. And so like all the stuff that all the cells that are getting blown up from the antibiotics and things like that. And so I'm pretty miserable for about a week. Ike saw me. Um, was, and then yeah. I've never seen, that was crazy. It looked like your leg was all sorts of different colors and Whoa. swollen. And it was, that was crazy. Absolutely was, crazy. looks like you, you look like a burn victim actually. It, it, it did. It did kind of look like a burn on the top of it. It's a weird deal. And huh. what's crazy is when you press like press a meaty area on it, you can see your thumb imprint in it. Like the way your skin reacts, it's just, it's crazy. Like it, it leaves a little dent in there for a second till, till the fluid comes back. It's, it's an odd deal. So, um, I get that treated and taken care of, but one of the things with antibiotics is you guys know the rule. You have to take the antibiotics till you're done. So I've been taking this antibiotic for a long time and I start having a reaction about 10 days into the 14 days of taking this antibiotic. And I got hives from like neck all the way down. And so the hives were worse than the infection from my reaction to the antibiotics. So that literally put me out of commission most of September. So Brandon went in and chased after the bucks that um, we found and he found more people than he found deer. And <laughs> so probably good. I wasn't on that hunt. I probably would have, uh, not um not done well in that scenario <laughs> so <laughs> you wouldn't have been so pleasant when you ran into people is that what you're saying no <laughs> I, i'd have told him to stop stalking me um, <laughs> and so we ended up um ended up not going with him i just laid low for october or just all of september and then i went in on a um, little before october 1st and found a found a good buck um and i end up killing him the next day. And it was a, it was a good hunt. It was a lot of fun. That buck is, um, sitting on my wall. I, this is another funny confession. My wife told me this year that Scott, you are no longer allowed to save capes and say that you're someday going to get it mounted. You must actually start getting them mounted. And so I'm going to be doing a lot of taxidermy in the next little while. <laughs> Apparently I'm, I'm a hoarder when it comes to mule deer capes. Um, so good, good woman. When she tells you that you got to go get your deer mounted, yeah, stop, that's... stop, uh, <laughs> you know, being unselfish for the family. I, I, I think she just that. wanted the freezer space. Well, there's that too, but I like to tell people <laughs> that I have a really good wife. So, <laughs> so anyway, it was a good fall. Um, my dad and I went on an elk hunt. It was a, t it was a tough hunt. You have to time the migration, right? And we were about a week off on that. So that was a challenge, but it was still a good hunt. Um, seeing, seeing a country, you know, and doing that sort of thing. Didn't have any late season elk hunts. Like I had last year, I actually had two of those last year. So that was a blast to go do, but that was how my fall went. So I'm not going to complain when I killed 185 inch deer and we killed yeah. a few does and things like that around here. But you know, those aren't the hunts that everybody wants to see pictures of and things like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> No, it sounds like a good fall overall, other than, uh, you, you seem to recover from, uh, your bacteria that you got going on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, I'm 100% healed. I'm proof that you won't die if you get it treated, but man, it was a, it was a weird deal. It was not pleasant. Yeah. I will tell you, I, Scott handled it a lot better than I thought he would. Cause they found those, they found two huge deer and on their scouting trip and then when it came to opening seat or opening the opening hunt he was unable to go I, I thought oh gosh i hope he doesn't do something stupid like sucks like a pistol over this because he was pretty <laughs> heartbroken over it <laughs> <laughs> the one buck was big like he's uh i I, I put him, I can, I looked at him. I put him somewhere between 190, 195 mainframe. And he had a lot of stickers to not. He's he, over I, 200. Yeah. So he's, Ooh. he's definitely, um, he's definitely a big buck. He's, he's not, he's, he's the second biggest buck I've ever found. Really? Uh, first he was biggest not going to be fun to hunt ago. though. No. Cause you guys found him from a long ways away and that glass did a lot of the walking. Yep. It was over 2,000 yards away. I, I, I use the, uh, we have the SIG range finding binos. And so I was able to use those pretty well and get them steady and actually get the 2,000 yards. I was pretty impressed with that deal. Yeah. So it worked pretty good. Yeah. That's, that's a ways away. <laughs> it is a long ways to, away. 
to to oh. find them for sure. You know, and and uh, you know, s- similar to you know how we had the, those September's that lined up. When I mm-hmm. when I came back home, I was like just down, and because you know, then doctor after I got some blood work was like, you need to not do any physical activity for a month. And I was like, all right, well, white tail season's opening October the 2nd. And, and I was like, I had a spot at a buck that I was after in the, in the Appalachian mountains here. And, and, uh, I ended up, I was like, well, this doesn't really count as physical activity. If I go slow, it was just about two (laughs) miles, two miles into my, uh, to my tree that I was going to climb into. And, and, uh, I hiked in, I ended up killing my biggest buck to date that opening day. And, um, so that, that made it nice. I was able to kind of recover there after after that and uh and then went up That's to awesome yeah it was it was awesome then went up to new york and and shot a buck there so it was it was a, it was a good fall after after that it recovered a little bit so <laughs> <laughs> you, just yeah. had to, you just had to get all that out of the way yep exactly so i'll be i'll be back out west next year and um you know looking uh i'm planning on hunting montana hopefully um should get i have some points in a tag that i really want to want to draw there so uh elk, or that's, deer? Uh, elk. and then um okay. and i'll probably get all well, the combo then hopefully and uh be able to go back out in november my brother lives in montana now so i uh have a place to place to go so i'm planning on is that where's he live in montana uh big timber just outside of oh, okay. Bo- bozeman there so um he works for c sharps uh rifle a company yep. there so he is a gunsmith and um yeah he he they went my dad went out there this year and they killed two mule deer and a white tail late in in the november hunt and stuff and i really want to do that too so that's kind of what Pretty i'm cool. what i'm looking at for this upcoming year that's cool that's fun that's a lot of yeah. fun it's 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 tough because i mean tags are getting uh you know more difficult i guess mm-hmm. to come by now and you know, it's, it's when I say, hopefully I draw it. Like, I mean, I, I should based off of what I'm looking at, you know, in tag hub and stuff, be able to draw the tag I want, but I'm worried about getting just the general tag in Montana, <laughs> yep. you yeah. know, and that's, I should have drew it last year, but I didn't think I'd be able to get the general tags. So that's why I cashed in in Colorado. And it's just, it's a, it's definitely, uh, definitely times are changing and you gotta be a little bit more prepared for it. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's some strategies, you know, that's the beauty of uh, tag hub has some tag strategies inside of it. If you're a member, you get kind of the secret sauce on how, how you can parlay points. And, and there's some unique things that are happening, especially in Montana, uh, with drawing and, and how they're going to, you know, separate the outfitter, t- the tags that the outfitters need versus the general public. And, and it's, that's going to help, but yeah, it's it's going to be hard, and that's why resources like Tag Hub are so important because you're getting the inside scoop of somebody that spends a lot of time. You know, Dan, who writes the Montana, we're just talking Montana, but every state out west, we have the same type of person. He's he's from Montana. Uh, he lives here in Wyoming now, but he's he grew up in Montana and he hunts two or three hunts up there a year, uh, different you know all the different species, and he he spends you know a pile a thousand hours a year, uh, just researching (laughs) and, you know, understanding the system and, and paying attention to how they're changing it and what they're doing and, you know, things that, that are affecting the, the Joe blow hunters, uh, you know, that's our audience. And, you know, as they, they fight this Croner crossing thing. And as they, as they work on the, the, you know, that the outfitter tag allocations and, and how that's going to work. I mean, it's, it's unique. And, and, and they got a big thing with elk up there this year. Uh, you know, it, how they're going to, if they're going to change it and what, what that looks like. And, and so, yeah, you gotta, the information is King, right? The guy with yeah. the, the most information yeah. wins. And, uh, this tag hub is part of that resource. And I would, I'd love to say that there's, you know, if you do these three things, you'll be able to shoot a 200 inch meal there. Well, that's, that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's kind of, in my opinion, that's the allure to it. Yep. You know, if, if it was easy, everybody would do it and then it, and then it wouldn't have the luster and it wouldn't have the, 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 the feeling of accomplishment. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, I, you know, I, I live researching through the winter time and, and I think that's for me, I love the planning part of it. Like that's what I'd love doing and like 
thinking about what could happen in the fall based off of the research I'm doing and going through it and reading everything like on Tag Hub and being able to try to understand what what potential hunts I could do. And then, you know, looking out, you know, from what I want to do this year, what I want to do in two or three years and what I want to do in 10 years and kind of planning all that stuff out. And I, I agree. I mean, information is king and being able to have that collectively, you know, in one place. And I think that's what's so useful out of from those types of resources mm-hmm. because you know the information's out there somewhere but you'd have to spend literally like you said thousands of hours to be able to compile if not more right. to compile it and understand it and and break it down in that kind of that kind of way you know yeah when you post hunting photos on Instagram, they get censored. When you post on Go Wild, you get virtual fist bumps from fellow hunters. When you buy gear on Amazon, you gas up a billionaire spaceship. When you buy gear on Go Wild, we donate to a camp that teaches kids to hunt, fish, and shoot. See the difference? Go Wild is a free social community built by hunters for hunters. Join today at DownloadGoWild.com, and I'll give you 10 bucks just for setting up your account. And you'll keep unlocking Go Wild rewards as you share content, because guess what? We like hunting pictures. Join at DownloadGoWild.com or in the App Store. Absolutely. I, I would, I'd venture a guess, and Ike, correct me, because I know you crunch a lot of these numbers, but we probably sit every year with our entire team that works on Tag Hub and does the research. And, you know, I'm, I'm including myself in that. Plus, we've um, we've now gotten to the point where we've got data people, like their entire job is processing data, making sure that we've got it done correctly. But, you know, we used to say that just on the MRS and the magazine was 4,000 hours, 4,000 man hours. Well, I think we're way past that now with the focus intensity now that we've put oh, yeah, it to make sure. We're closer to eight, 8,000, between 8 and 10, depending on um, what what's happening. You know, you have a, yep. a, a, an area like Montana where they start splitting seasons and, and areas up. And, of course, <laughs> that doubles all of that inform or all that data. So therefore you double all the, the workload, but it's, it's a lot And it. And we're not talking, you know, we're not talking like, Oh, hey, these guys just kind of half-ass crunch numbers. That's what they do all day and they yeah. love it. And you know, they are statisticians and that's what they, they <laughs> eat and breathe. And uh, we have a, one of the guys is, is former military and that's what he did for the military. So, I mean, if they, <laughs> If he can crunch numbers for the Department of Justice or Department of Defense, yep. you know, this is actually he's he's hilarious, but he's he's like, I just love this stuff. Just just absolutely love this stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm I'm glad there's use out there, but whew, I don't know what yeah. we would talk about at dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's we, <laughs> that's funny. And and uh, you know, with with tags, you know, being harder to get, like, you know, if someone you know what? It doesn't matter really if you're from Pennsylvania, like myself, or even if you live out west. If you're non-resident somewhere, you're non-resident. You know, you typically yeah. know your own state um, and how that works. But trying to hunt, you know, somewhere else and putting together those strategies. I mean, you know, when I was looking on Tag Hub earlier, and I'm looking at the application deadlines that you have for all the different states and when you need to apply and all that. I mean, it's a lot of a lot mm-hmm. of stuff, and all the states are different. And every one of them is confusing, um, yes. you know, if you're not, if you're not really familiar with it and, and trying to understand how to break that down. So I'd, I'd be interesting really to hear from each of you. Maybe we'll start, start with you, Scott, and like how, how you look at h- how you prioritize what you want to do and then how you're looking mm-hmm. at it from like a short term strategy, um, mm-hmm. to midterm, long term, if that's how you, how you look at it. Oh, yeah. So how I've, I've started it and, you know, this is, this is kind of cool because I really in, in building tag hub and then starting to work here, I was able to really, 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 um, start diving in and learning the system. So when I moved here at age 30, that funny point where you start paying off student loans and you can start doing a little bit more with life is when I started applying out of state. Well, it made the most sense because I write the MRS for Nevada to really start diving deep and applying in Nevada and learning how that system works. So I started there, but I understood one thing that Nevada for the most part is a dream state. And what I mean by that is you have to pick your states that, you know, it is a long shot to draw and Nevada is that. And so in Nevada, the big elk are king. 
That is what lots of people dream of in Nevada. A 170 mule deer, if you find that in most places in Nevada, you need to be going after it. Whereas with a bull elk there, there's a lot of places where there are guys who are willing to eat their tags because they know it is a once in a lifetime opportunity at a bull that's going to push way past 350. I look at the 50 inch main beam charts at Nevada reports and you can kill an absolute giant there. Now, some of their seasons are late, so you may have to settle for, you know, okay, that thing does have its royal tine broken, but it's a dream state for a a really big bull. Now, I'm blessed that I live in Wyoming, so Wyoming is my opportunity state, and you have to make your home state your bread and butter. And so Wyoming is my bread and butter in that I know that I can kill a big mule deer every single year. And so I do that through our general opportunities, but I live here. So that is to my advantage. Oh, Someone hold, who hold on, here. Scott, let me cut you off here for a second. So you said, you know, your home state's your bread and butter. Mm-hmm. Well, mine's Pennsylvania and I can't draw a damn <laughs> okay. elk bag there. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I live with the elk all around where I, I live at and I see 400 inch bull, but I can't hunt them. <laughs> no, okay. I, I just, <laughs> okay. fair enough. Fair enough. I'm, I'm just messing with you, but <laughs> no, well deserved. Remind me who the audience is. That's yeah. always a great way to put it. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so, c- continue with that. Sorry. <laughs> so Wyoming's my high opportunity. A guy like you in your seat would probably be looking at a high opportunity like Colorado that has opportunities. Like there are still archery over the counter. Um, there's still rifle over the counter, fourth season, some third season, kind of depending on how things go. But then there's also easy to draw opportunities in a place like Colorado. Idaho is getting tougher. Um, their system changed. So they, they used to be a stalwart for everybody that, you know, they'd rotate between Colorado and Idaho and being able to get those over the counter tags. Idaho's changed the last few years. You have to be on the ball and ready to, um, stand in line for your over the counter tag. That's actually an application system because they're putting you in order. So, you know, you're just waiting to pay right at the car. I waited three hours and, you know, in in 2019 was the first time I hunted Idaho and I killed a bull there the first day. And it was like the best. I was like, man, I love Idaho. Can't wait to go back last year. I didn't realize that everything Mm -hmm. was changing. I was too late this year. I was ready to go. I had it up on my computer at work for three hours. I was number 11,873 <laughs> in line and all the, everything was gone. So I'd never even got it. So yeah, that's definitely yeah. changed. <laughs> um, well, and you know, Idaho Boise is the largest, has the largest growing uh, growth as a percentage. Uh, if any place in the U S they grew like 8% in one year, which is that's mind numbing. So the and and all those people that's people don't understand all those people are moving to Idaho for a reason they're they're leaving something and they're coming to Idaho and more than likely they're they're coming to Idaho to recreate and yeah. hunting is one of those big things um, backpacking and all that stuff but hunting's it and it's changing it's going to change forever but I'm sorry Scott I cut you off go ahead <laughs> all right so. Idaho used to be in that high opportunity category. Colorado is kind of one of the one of the last remaining ones that has an elk herd that can sustain that. Mule deer, that's not the case. But you build a strategy where you want to hunt regularly. So for me, that's Wyoming. For a guy like you, Colorado works in that scenario. And then what you want to do is you want to find your, your middle of the road. And this is what guy is qualified as our green chip units. They don't take max points most of the time. Some green chips do, but um, they'll take you know, four or five points and you want to be able to hunt those fairly regularly. Um, Antelope in Wyoming is a great example of a species where you can get on a regular rotation of hunting with several different points. Um, two, Two to seven points can get you on a pretty good antelope hunt on a fairly regular basis in Wyoming if you plan and do a strategy. So you build a strategy and if you're a mule deer guy like me, Build it around, okay, my bread and butter is Wyoming, and that's where I'm going to hunt regularly. Then I'm going to look at other states. Montana is another opportunity state, or it used to be. I'm looking at, I'm only going to be able to hunt Montana every third year the way that this is going. And so I'll build a rotation of all these different places with Nevada being my dream. I've kicked Arizona to the curb because I'm not going to go apply there. I stand no chance. Um, even with them doing some of the random opportunities, I just crunch the numbers. It makes more sense for me to stay in a place like Nevada on some of these high-end hunts. And so that's how I've built that strategy where – 
Whereas, you know, coming from where you're at, I would highly recommend you play probably even more than what I do out West. Um, just play that game. Um, we did the, it was the four state strategy, right? Like that, that yep. Mike wrote. And so I would, a, it was a, it was a four state strategy and a five year plan. So it's not, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to hunt. You don't want to, I mean, Bo, you've killed an elk. You, that's, that's not something you want to do your first trip out West. I know that's a goal, but that's a five-year plan mm-hmm. and come out West, hunt an antelope, hunt a mule deer, you know, get used to it yep. and play around with those areas and those draw odds. And, and then, you know, start <clears throat> working up the line of antelope, then some deer and then deer, maybe an elk hunt where you shoot, you know, just a bull or a cow and, and get used to that. Cause you, know, you draw that, you draw that really good area elk hunting in Wyoming or Colorado and you shoot an 800 pound animal, you get on the ground. There's a lot of work yet to be done. And if you just killed yourself, like your buddies did for a deer, you, you know, can you yep. imagine having to go back in there again yeah. for another trip to get the rest of him out? And hopefully you don't have to do it un- two more times. Yep. I mean, it's, it's a whole different game when you start hunting out. I, I want to highlight that point that you just said there. Cause I wish someone would have told me that when I started, cause I, I started by reading cam haynes's book backcountry bow hunting i'm like i gotta go hunt elk in the backcountry i gotta go in and do that <laughs> and and it took it took me four years to kill an elk and do that and i'm like man i and i definitely should have started slower on you know hunting some other <laughs> species and some different places and and it because it, unless you're extremely motivated and driven to continue to do so um it I, I couldn't even agree. And it's even just trying to break one down and learning how to yep. pack them out. You know, for most way tail hunters where I'm at, we, we do that as far as we, we break them down and pack them out. But most people don't do that. And like yeah. trying to do that with an elk at first. Oh. Wait, I was talking to a, a guy that lives in, in, in Idaho and he'd moved there his first year, first year of residency. He goes up and he's, he's an ex Marine, uh, and I mean, tougher nails just got out of the army. So he's in shape and, and, you know, he thinks he's invincible. Well, actually after the story, I'm convinced he might be, but <laughs> he goes up four miles up into the, into the mountains, shoots this deer. And uh, of course he's, he's from Cal Southern California originally shoots the deer and gets up to deer and is like, Oh, oh. I don't know what to do with this. I, I know there's more to this process, but I, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> So he straps his 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 uh, backpack type thing onto the deer and drags it four and a half miles out. Halfway out, he runs into this guy that's chucker hunting. The guy's <laughs> chucker hunting, and he looks at looks at Greg and goes, "Well, would you just kill that?" He goes, "Yeah." And you're just going to drag it out? Well, yeah, I guess. And Greg Greg goes. I could tell by the guy's face he, that I was doing something wrong. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> Drags it all the way to the truck. Okay. On behind him. And this, thank God it's a deer, not an elk. Mm-hmm. Drags it to the truck and then guts it. Yeah. He goes, I got back to the truck and went, oh, I bet you have to gut this thing like a fish. He goes, I grew up in Southern California fishing. I never even thought about it. We throw them in the cooler and then we gut them later. He got drug up four and a half miles with the guts in it. He said there wasn't a single <laughs> stitch of hide or hair on both sides by the time he was done. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> he goes, I wish somebody would have told me. So for, for the audience out there that hasn't come out west <laughs> and hunted, don't do that. There's tons and tons of YouTube videos. Get on yeah. Eastman's Hunting Journal's YouTube channel and learn how to break down an elk or yep. learn how to break down a deer. We do it the same way. I don't care if it's antelope, deer, or elk. Elk just to have more meat and it's just a bigger project, but break them down to, to, uh, the gutless method and mm-hmm. be able to put them in a pack and, and walk them out. It's even if you have to do multiple trips, that's the way to do it. And, oh, 100%. and you know, that's just one thing you should know how to do. Yep. Well, we're, that's the, the, that's the type of stuff we're going to put in tag hub is, you yep. know, a to a to b or a to z on, on hunting, how to break down an animal, how to, you know, how to, how to form your pack to you and everything where to set up a tent we're, we're going to do these live events this coming year that really narrow uh focused small groups and you know everything you would need to know come out west with us 60 guys and we're gonna we're gonna have a, a two-day course on everything you need to know yep. 
um, from A to Z. And even, you know, the, you know, I was telling the story earlier, how, how our family started in the hunting industry was live lectures, giving people information and entertainment, um, the stuff they've never done or seen before. And that's this, we're just going to continue it with this, where you can walk through where you set a camp up, you know, don't put it in a stand of dead timber. Don't, you know, don't put it on top of a, a ridge at 13,000 feet. Cause when those monsoons come through and they have lightning, uh, you turn into a <laughs> lightning rod, mm -hmm. you know, th things that a lot of guys went, Oh, I never thought of that. I probably would have done that. I'm glad you bring it up that type of, you know, mm -hmm. just like you said, I'm, I wish somebody would have told me when I killed a, a bull back four, four, it took me four years. It was, it was hard work. A lot of well, work. Wait, wait. What makes me laugh about that is my, my cousin, I told you, killed that mule deer. The first year that, that he went mule deer hunting in Colorado, I was hunting elk in a neighboring unit and our other buddy shot an elk when they were back in their pack. And they thought it was a good idea because out here we use deer carts. So they packed oh a deer, <laughs> they called a deer cart way back in and tried taking an elk out on it and said it was the absolute like not at one like they had it cut up they had it cut up yeah, it was but, for, but still pulled, but. said they were losing stuff they were having <laughs> it was an absolute mess I, and the trails aren't like they are here there's not logging roads and you know stuff no. like that to, it it was I, it cracked me up when i heard that they they <laughs> they did good that. idea poor execution yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's just very useful for for those of us that had never done it you know before <laughs> oh that's great that's awesome I, I i you know how many of those stories i hear a year just you know guys come out out west the first time and and you know it's like i said they're great ideas and sometimes they work but a lot of times you gotta that's why i say <laughs> start slow come out here kill an antelope then go you know, desert deer hunting, and then try maybe mm -hmm. a, a a truck hunt with, for for mule deer, where you're in in the mountains, and you get used to that and what to watch for and what to what to how to handle certain situations and weather. I mean, that's the other one that, got, that gets guys out here. You can see the weather coming. You know, where you live, you're like, oh, it's raining. I didn't know it was going to rain. I should have looked at the weather out here. You can see it coming, and when it yep. does, it's full on Donkey Kong. I mean, it mm -hmm. it can it can leave you overnight two and a half foot of snow where it's hard to get around and that and then the wind starts blowing and you can't get out reekers and i were on a deer hunt when that happened mm -hmm. for two days we sat in a tent and it snowed two and a half feet and then the wind picked up and we, you know we got out of there but it was one of those things where you go oh my gosh if we wouldn't have left when we did we'd have been stuck there because that wind drifts yep. that snow on those passes and you're you're there you're not going to crawl through that stuff 25 foot path a 25 foot drift you're not going to crawl through that. And if you do, you probably crawl to the other side and die in an avalanche. I mean, it's not, not to be screwed around with. So once yeah. again, knowledge is king. Now it's just nope. scared the crap out of everybody. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, we had tag fun. I'll show you how to not do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Shameless plug. I'm sorry. Was that the uh, trip where you dumped a, like 32 uh, ounces of water out of your tent? Yes. Yes, uh, a pretty popular brand. I won't name them because that's just mean. They were they were new in the world then, but very popular brand started making tents, and uh, we we're like, oh, I was going to try this, and I knew it was going to rain, but it, we didn't know it was going to snow. That was that was that even shocked the weatherman. That's right, twenty percent of the time, and <laughs> it, for two days it it snowed on us, and because of condensation and everything else, at the end of it, when we decided to leave, I poured out enough water out of the bottom of my tent to fill my water bottle. So I was, was miserable, swimming, basically. Yeah, yeah. He, he was on a water bed all night. His pad floated. <laughs> if I didn't, if I wouldn't have had waterproof down sleeping bag i i would have froze to death absolutely i'd have it might have been crawled up in because it was scott and we had a camera guy with us i'd have been sleeping in their vestibule or something it was yeah horrible. Well, hopefully you left the cialis at home at that point <laughs> <laughs> Those funny noises coming out of that tent i wasn't sleeping i was wet hey, so <laughs> for the record for the record, I have never used any of those drugs for that reason. That you know of. <laughs> you know. Well, then. Oh, that turned sour quick. <laughs> yes, it did. I, I don't even know how to handle this right now. But, you know, it's uh, 
All right, Entertaining, we'll, right? Yeah. Well, all right. We'll go. We'll go back to the, <laughs> the application <laughs> strategies. All right. So you were talking about the the four state strategy in the in the mm-hmm. five year plan, and so you kind of go through and you circle them, and then you have like your dream ones, like your Nevadas and and everything <laughs> yep. there. Correct. Yep. Yeah, and I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here real quick, okay. Scott. I don't. You, one of the other things that guys have a tendency to do is they start, uh, I call it uh, area hopping. And that's really dangerous because they'll go into an area and they won't see anything or they won't see anything that they like. And so the next year or, you know, it takes them two years to draw it or whatever, they'll go to a different area. The problem with that, and that's part of this five-year plan. The problem with that is you never get to know that area. Yep. Who knows? Maybe those deer are in there, but you're catching it on a full moon week or if you're seeing deer and you're not seeing big bucks maybe they're nocturnal right then or maybe you know maybe they just shed their shed their velvet and what people don't know is when those deer shed their velvet they get sick for three days i mean it, it literally makes them ill um you know or the other thing people don't understand is when they shed their velvet they when they're in velvet they rarely will walk through you know brush and stuff because that velvet's basically it's cuticles there's 180 inches of cuticle scraping trees and stuff and it hurts. So they don't do that. As soon as they strip it though, they go into, into a different mode. They, they go into a fall mode and then they're hard to find because they're in thick brush and all that stuff. So don't give up on that area. Make sure that you're in there. I I call it a three-year strategy. Make sure you hit that area three times, three different years. Uh, If you weren't happy with the first time, maybe adjust your hunt, slide it forward, slide it back. Uh, look at the moon phases, that type of stuff, but you'll get to know that area. So yep. when you're in that area, you go, I know what's on the other side of the ridge because I've been there. And, and that's the better, you know, that's the better yep. habitat over there. So let's go over there or mm-hmm. we don't have to go in as far. We're seeing all the deer lower. So let's not go in as far that type of information so that you, you mm-hmm. have a three year plan or area. The other thing is pick a state. If you want, if you want elk, Focus on Colorado, but I'm telling you, hunt deer and antelope a couple times in Colorado first, um, and then plan on elk. If you want, if you're looking for a really nice mule deer hunt, Montana's the place. If you're looking for a little bit of everything, it's a little harder to draw maybe, but Montana or Wyoming has a plethora of hunts here that are easier hunts. We have some desert hunts for elk yep. that are an absolute blast. They're They're hard to draw. I will tell you that. Yep. They're an absolute blast. You can hunt antelope the same time you hunt elk. And it's fun to just go antelope hunting and hang out with guys that are hunting elk and, you know, you help them out and hey, yeah, I saw, you know, 300 head over there and it's got a real nice bull in it and you're kind of hunting elk. Um, and then, but pick a state that, that you want to focus species wise. Idaho is great for deer, um, really good for elk, really good for archery elk. Um, pick a state, pick an area. And stick with it for three years. Pick an area that you can hunt. Yep. And then, you know, it's after the five years, you'll have either stayed in that area for three years and moved or stay in that area for five years. And now you have, you know, you've got a couple trophies out of it. You've got a ton of meat, a ton of experience in that area. And then maybe yep. step it up to the next level. Okay, now I hunt a desert. I want to go, you know, we drive past this mountain range every year and I know I can draw that tag every four years and I've, I've been putting in for points. Now, this is the other thing. Don't focus on don't focus on hunting, you know, hunt deer and, and antelope, but always be buying that that elk point because you're yep. you're going to need it down the road. You're going to need it. Always be buying those points. Always be buying the points in the other states so that when you do hit that five year plan, you have points built up in the other states. And then you get on what we call, especially if you have some buddies. If you have five or six buddies and you rotate, you know, everybody's buying points and maybe they go with you on your antelope hunt and deer hunt in Wyoming and you go on your, their antelope and deer hunt in Montana. So you learn two different areas, you get to hunt it, but you're not the tag holder. And then you get in the the rotation with your buddies where everybody's drawn a decent tag every year and you're going along on those decent hunts. Um, And you're, you don't want it. I mean, nobody, not a lot of people. I I do know people that love to hunt by themselves and then, you know they're recluses but uh a lot of you, it's fun to share that <laughs> stuff right yeah I mean, who, who are you going to sit around a beer with or a glass of whiskey wyoming whiskey and and tell lies to uh if you don't have somebody back in the story up right 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, that's best it. fishing stories, two of you. So, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my strategy. That's how I that's how I would do it. <laughs> um, of course, you know, Scott and I, we we were blessed with being able to live here and be yep. residents here, and and you know, so Wyoming is a focus for us because we'd be stupid not to. We have we have a ton of of opportunity here. Uh, as residents, it's hard to get residency in Wyoming. I will tell you that you got to live here. They bench you from hunting and fishing for a year. You cannot hunt or fish pretty much can't hunt or fish some anywhere um, for a year to become a, a Wyoming resident. Yeah, no, that I, and one of the things that I pulled kind of out of what you were saying there too, is it sounds like, you know, you're saying you take, take those opportunities that you get and just get those reps in of hunting, you know, might yeah. not be that best yeah. tag, but you get those reps in. And then once you get that tag, you draw that, even if that's tagging along with somebody or just going to, to, you know, a lesser place that you keep continuing to hunt, you know, that's when you get those experience. And, you know, for me, like I hunted the same unit in Colorado for three years where I didn't kill an elk. But by that year three, I was having opportunities. I was just screwing them up. But I was learning that. And then that set me up for when I went to Idaho, that was a little bit better that, you know, I'd learned from all those screw ups to capitalize on the opportunity that, you know, that I did have. So that, I don't know. I think that's, that's something that's very useful. And it's funny that three year strategy, that's exactly how I use it for whitetails. And like, if I go into an area, I, I say to really know an area for, for me, I need three years to at least three years to, you know, first year is kind of exploratory and, you know, I'm logging notes and what I've seen and all these things. And then, you know, taking that data and figuring out how I need to adjust or pivot for the next year and then going in and continuing to refine that plan. Mm. Yep. And, it's like yep. breaking in boots. You know, you know, don't, don't take a brand new pair of boots on a backcountry hunt. That's, that's insane. But take it on an antelope hunt and break them in. And then you, yep. by the time you hit that five-year plan, those boots are broken and ready to rock and roll. Yeah. The same thing with your hunting strategy, with your hunting knowledge. And like you said, on year three, that's when you start making the mistakes when you're yep. having opportunities. Year four, uh, you've learned a lot. And, and it's year four and five is where you usually capitalize on on that strategy. Yeah. So I, I have a I have a question for you guys. Do you do you have do you have like some sort of a hunting budget that you have set aside or like for applying for all these things? Cause you know, applying for tags can add up quick, um, from the cost and like how you prioritize them. So like for you, Scott, you really like mule deer. So I'm, I'm assuming you prioritize, mm-hmm. you know, putting in yep. for points or whatever there and, and doing it that way. So I will shamelessly say that I'm part of the Dave Ramsey cult. Um, and so <laughs> I've gotten, um, you know, I've gotten to the point where we, we have savings, you know, we have, have money saved up and we do that on purpose. We're very intentional with the way we plan our budgets and do. So any trip that we do, we, we look and we say, okay, this is roughly what it would cost us to go right now. And we save that money. That's, that's how we operate. And that's what I've found to be the easiest way to do that. Um, now I'll, I'll say this, if you have a significant other, if you're, you know, if you're married, one of the easiest ways to make sure that you have a hunting budget, take your wife on other trips. And then it's <laughs> real easy when you're, you're saying you want to go do something It's like, okay, well this, you know, the, it, it just shows priority is, is what that's about. Mm-hmm. So, um, there's just, that's, that's how I do it on purpose is it's an actual hunting fund that we work on and do those sort of things to do that. But it's savings. It's, is, is all that that is. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's being able to play, you know, you know, there's a lot of States like Montana, Wyoming, where you can buy a point. You don't actually have to apply. Yeah. You just buy the point for yep. five bucks and you do that and you still buy the points until you get five, six points. And then you start applying. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing. You just start a, I always tell guys, just start a fund, go donate something, blood or whatever, some sort of human body, something <laughs> and it's a start kidney. a fund. Yeah. A kidney. You don't need two of those, uh, start a fund and then just re- use it and replenish it every year and then keep, keep growing so that when you do have enough points to draw something, you have enough money to pay for that. Um, that's, I don't know if it's the right way. That's, that's the way that I've found works the best. It's, yeah. And then you're, and then you're, and then, then it's not coming out. I call it the, my wife hates this. She's like, you're such an accountant. It's not coming out of the general fund. If that makes sense. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, all of a sudden June 11th, when Wyoming 
does their draws, the checkbook gets hit for 3000 bucks, And she's standing at the grocery store going, why doesn't my debit card work? <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. do that. Don't be that guy. Yep. Yeah. Um, it comes out, you know, it doesn't come out of the general fund. And and the I'm going to get hung up for this statement, but that's all right. Um, after years, they quit paying attention to it anyway. If it's in their own, if it's in your own little fund. Mm-hmm. I like it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, like Scott, like what you're talking about, the Dave Ramsey, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've been a Dave Ramsey follower from that sort. Now I have mm-hmm. my financial advisor, um, Jeff Bynum from the Financial Outfitter Group. Mm-hmm. He works with a lot of people in the hunting industry mm-hmm. and helps. And and he helped me kind of, un- he, he follows a lot of uh, Dave's stuff and has some of his own thoughts, but he's helped me learn that. And I mean, that's one of the reasons I started, you know, a lot of the reasons I started this podcast on the side before was because I wanted to be able to <laughs> do hunts, you know, like from the selfish reasons for it was I wanted to have some extra money, mm-hmm. you know, just a little bit to be able to, to go on some hunts and do these types of things. And, and, you know, and you can always find ways if it's important to you, you just got to, to, to figure that out. And like you said, segregate it and have that, that fund, uh, off to the side there. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I agree with, uh, the whole, um, making sure the significant others happy from, uh, mm-hmm. that standpoint too. So. Yep. Yep. And the kids, I mean, you gotta pay attention. Yep. Yeah. We, Brian Barney, which is, he's our, our Eastman elevated podcast. He's our host there. And he says it really well. Um, you know, he's very focused. He's probably one of the most focusedly intense people I've ever been around <laughs> when he's hunting. He's focused on hunting and he's not worrying about his, his, you know, his job, his day-to-day contracting work. He's not worried about his wife. He's not worried about his kids. And when he's being a father, he's not worried about hunting. He's not thinking about hunting. He's yep. not thinking about the podcast or he's not thinking about construction. And when he's at work, he's at freaking work. And when he's on the podcast, he's on the podcast. So be focused and tense. And then they don't feel like they're getting left out. But if you're, if you're, I call it lukewarm all the time on everything you do. It, it's it's yep. a struggle. It's a struggle. And, and I'm telling you, I'm, I travel this year. I was gone eight weeks uh, straight last year. I was gone 10 weeks straight uh, with my family. And I have two young kids, nine and 11 and a, and a very busy wife. She's got her own career and um, it's easy to do when they feel and they know that when I'm home, I'm home and it's father time. It's, it's husband time. Um, you know, I'm taking my wife on a new year's Eve date tomorrow and, and uh, it'll be all just her and I. We don't have to worry about the kids. Yeah. We don't have to worry about this job. I don't have to worry about the two other jobs that we have. <laughs> Everything else yeah. we do, it's just her and I. And so we're doing the same thing. We're going. We're I'm taking the whole family. We're going to go up um, up to Billings, and we're going to go you know rent a motel room. I'm going to throw the kids in the pool, and we're going to do that for about 24 hours right before show season. You know, another time yep. when we're we're gone a lot. Just so intentionally do that. Rachel and I said that's what we're going to do together you know we're going to kind of make this a habit before busy times of year just a little bit of time that's just us checking out but you don't hunt good if home's not taken care of no and you don't home good when hunting's not taken care of i mean it's just it's focused intensity i like i like that term and brian is someone that i look up to and i've had him on the podcast you wouldn't he's really short (laughs) (laughs) but he he just i I love his mentality with everything and how he has he's just yeah that i I don't know he's he's one of those guys that seems to seems from the outside to to have it together that's for sure Uh, and he's i i will tell you he 100 what you hear on the podcast that is who brian is uh people ask that all the time is he always like that i go oh yeah sometimes we take him to shows and i look at so the other guys and I go, I just go, I need some negativity in my life. Is this guy, this guy's killing me. Yeah. Everything's joyful. I, I think I'm going to order pizza. A pizza? Oh, man, that would be awesome. A pizza? Oh, I just, that's, that's so cool. Like, oh, God, it has onions on it. Oh, onions are good. They're not. <laughs> that, that is who Brian is. That's, that's exactly 100% Brian who his is. personality is. Yeah. I love Brian to death. He's a, he's a great, a great host and a great tool here at Eastman's and great partner. He's, He's the shit. Yeah. <laughs> I cussed. First time, I'm sorry. No, you're good. I I, I put the explicit tag on there anyways, just in case. So we're good. <laughs> I got that Eastman guy on, and he's usually drinking. Yeah. So. <laughs> he's got that Wyoming whiskey flowing through his veins. So. Actually, I'm, today I'm not. I'm drinking I'm drinking uh, coffee, but 
because oh. I have stuff to do tonight that would not it would be impaired would not be good yeah <laughs> all right fair enough <laughs> um but uh the, the one last thing i wanted to cover here so okay so you know you're looking at these strategies but how are you finding out what how many points something takes or how to even build these strategies you know explaining how that works you know within tag hub you know is what th- th- that i've used for it and just explain that a little bit so within tag hub we've got um, we've got several different ways to do that. But the first thing is you have to kind of have an idea of what you want to hunt and some of learning tag hub and learning the West. But I feel like the way that we've set it up with what we call the primary filter, it lets you really figure out what and how those hunts work. And so it, it breaks down all the different qualifications that are there. So like in Wyoming, there are brow tine only uh, hunts, and then there's any, any elk or either sex hunts, and then there's bull only. And so you have to choose between those. And so understanding that, oh, that's why this region of the state has that tag hub lets you do that through the primary filter. So you start there and then what you do is you get those things lit up. And then there's another filter that we've got that shows exactly how many points as a non-resident you would need. And then the next cool thing that you can do is say you've got seven points. Well, you can set it up where you can look anywhere from four to seven points. Basically, all the hunts that you think might be worth burning seven points on, you can take that and you can make all of them show up on the map. Then you click on it and it'll tell you exactly how many points, whether you need to do the special or whether you need to do just the, you know, just the random regular draw. That's that's Wyoming as an example, but that's, that's there in every single state. You're able to really get to know what you want through the primary filter. Then you use that secondary filter to really get down and dirty with what you have and what matters to you point wise. You can even look at the, the amount of pressure that is in a certain unit or area and say, okay, I want to find the lowest pressured area that I can draw with the points that I have. You can literally set up three different filters. Well, and it's not just points or pressure. You can do terrain. You can do mm-hmm. public land versus private land. You, can, I mean, I, I can't, is there 12? I think there's 12 different uh, columns on that. I can't yeah. remember them all, but there's 12 different uh, and there's three searches. So you can narrow it down uh, pretty quickly on what you want to do. And, and a data guy like you or I, I play with it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I have four, four points and I want to hunt high country, which what are those? And I go and search those and, you know, I throw out the, throw out the both ends of the spectrum and I look in the middle and I, then I pull them up on, on the map and I, you know, look at the country and pull up the, the Boone and Crockett statistics, which we have in there and how many deer, or I'm using deer now, but how many trophy animals have been killed in there and over the years and watch that trend. And, you know, because of the year, the year versus the size. And it's just, it, it if you're a data guy, you can spend a billion years in there messing around with, with different serials. If you're not a data guy and you go, Hey, this is exactly what I'm looking for. You can quickly get to that information. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's, it's huge. It's, it cuts off number one, it cuts off the, the, how daunting that task can be. And it, it makes it palatable to guys that don't play in those circles every day. Yeah. I, I had, um, I'd spent a lot of time with Scott last year diving into it and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love the data part of it. And I love the three year average. That was one of my favorite things because you know you can have off years and and everything and that kind of gives you a a pretty good example Mm -hmm. of of how how that went you know in that specific area or whatever and i I think the color-coded maps and everything just makes it simple but you can dive super deep if you want to yeah and it's you know you have three-year average that you know you have weather events or you have fires or whatever um it, it kind of makes it a little flatter which is cool yeah definitely well, cool. Is there anything else that you guys think that you want to add uh, to the end of this here as far as for helping people kind of look at the application strategy? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I think make sure you have a strategy. Don't go in there willy nilly. Yep. Um, get a Tag Hub membership. And if you have with Tag Hub, you don't only just get the data. And, and we've talked a lot about that. But you get this this insight. We have uh, specific blogs and information inside there. We have my dad's books, uh, elk, antelope, and deer. And, you know, it, it's deep dive into both of those and all three of those species on how to hunt them. Uh, you could read that in there. Um, you get to print magazines. So every mm-hmm. month you get a magazine that shows up at, at your door and, and uh, you get to read 
success stories from other <laughs> tag members and other guys out west, you know, elk, deer, sheep, moose, goat, you name it. Um, it also has the MRS. So if, if you're into the, the paper version of Tag Hub, it, it's in the back of the magazine. It's not as elaborate as yeah. Tag Hub because Tag Hub has everything, including cow hunts and, and uh, doe hunts in there now. Um, and then, you know, you also get some cool stuff right now. We got we got specials running and discount codes inside. If you're a Tag member, you get discounts on gear, like really good gear, mm-hmm. you know, backpacks and rifles and clothing and uh, boots and, and even electric bikes so yeah uh yeah i'm gonna shameless plug the whole the whole thing um yeah. you know get 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 your membership and 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 oh and the other cool thing is you get expert analysis you know if you have a question or whatever those questions come to scott and his team yep. and they will handle them personally and and hey i got eight points in wyoming what should i do with them that those type of questions yep. um yeah so hopefully it wasn't too shameless but no that's i am a it's helpful. That's what, that's what we're here to do. And yep. that's what I'm here to do is give that information for people and know that those options are out there. So yep, just trying to make it easy for everybody. Yeah. Anything else yep. from you, Scott, man, I think, I think I hit it. I'm, I'm excited. Um, I think your discount code is actually still active though. Bo 20. So if anybody wants a discount on tag hub, you are welcome to use a uh, Bose code. There we go. Use it and, uh, and save a little bit of, a little bit of dollars and get some good tags. <laughs> I hope Perfect. so. Yeah. Is there any? Is there anywhere else uh, that you want to give some shameless plugs and direct people to to check anything out? YouTube. Uh, yeah, our YouTube channel is growing. Lots and lots of content on there. Uh, we have a Beyond the Grid uh, webisode series. That's uh, I don't remember how many episodes they're on, but it's a lot of you know Western hunting. Uh, YouTube channel has tips and tactics, and it has tons of content to watch learn how to do everything from tying knots that you need in the backcountry to breaking down elk and you know every, all the entertainment hunts uh even some <laughs> prairie dog hunts and bear <laughs> hunts and yeah there's tons of cool things on youtube and uh, social media check it out check us out on social media and and uh, stay informed information is king Great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. And maybe, maybe again, maybe I'll get to have you on again sometime. We'll see. Yeah. Well, appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity. But we'll, <laughs> anytime. All right. Well, thanks guys. Yep. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.